to the Virtual Women in STEAM Week Gala, presented by Let's Go Full Steam Ahead. I'm your host and founder of Let's Go Full Steam Ahead, Sierra Marie Bond. Women in STEAM Week is an annual celebration held the third week in October and was created to honor the women throughout history who have paved the way for future innovators in the realms of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. This week was also created to empower the next generation of innovators. As the astronaut Sally Ride said, you can't be what you can't see. So we're sharing STEAM stories to inspire the future innovators to see their own potential to thrive. This year, we're excited to take the celebrations global as we host a virtual gala to kick off the Women in STEAM Week festivities. In this virtual gala, you'll hear from speakers from across the country, sharing their STEAM education and engagement efforts, information on how to increase diversity and inclusion in STEAM fields, and highlighting women in their lives that they find inspirational. Follow along with our online playlist to stream each episode of this gala, anywhere, anytime. You can learn more about Let's Go Full Steam Ahead by visiting our website, Let's go full steam ahead .com. Now, let's meet this episode's featured speaker. When talking about her career as an astronaut, Sally Ride once said, I never went into physics or the astronaut corps to become a role model, but after my first flight, it became clear to me that I was one, and I began to understand the importance of that to people. Young girls need to see role models in whatever careers they may choose just so they can picture themselves doing those jobs someday. You can't be what you can't see. I want to start this off by introducing myself, the voice behind the video. My name is Maggie Brown, and the first thing most people learn about me is how much I love space exploration. I love it so much that I'm getting a degree in aerospace engineering and want to work with rockets in the future. But for now, I work as a camp counselor at a space museum. So my love of space, coupled with the fact that I work at a space museum, has caused me to have a deep passion and admiration for space history. When talking about the history of space exploration, it's important to acknowledge that the history we are told is heavily focused on the men involved with these efforts. But recently, the stories of the women who worked alongside these men have begun to surface. In 2017, the movie Hidden Figures debuted in theaters. That was my senior year of high school, and when I say that that movie changed my life, I mean it. I had never heard of women working for NASA in a technical role during the space race, and Mary Jackson, the first black female aerospace engineer at NASA, quickly became one of my heroes. After reading the book and watching the movie a couple dozen times, I started to look into the stories of other women during this time period. I read about Margaret Hamilton, a computer scientist who developed the onboard flight software for the Apollo program, and Mary Sherman Morgan, the scientist who invented Hydine, the liquid fuel that powered the rocket that launched America's first satellite. But the most striking story I have found so far is the story of the Mercury 13, a group of women who participated in a privately funded program in the 1960s to train like astronauts, with the hope that one day they would get to explore the stars like their male counterparts. So I'm going to share some of their journeys with all of you today. On October 4th, 1957, the world changed forever with the launch of Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. This event is considered by many to be the beginning of the period of history we now call the space race. The idea of beating the Soviet Union by sending a person into space rather than an uncrewed vehicle excited the American public. So the Eisenhower administration began narrowing down the qualifications to become an astronaut. But how do you figure out the qualifications for a position that hasn't ever existed? Initially, a variety of professional backgrounds were looked at, including Arctic explorers, mountain climbers, deep sea divers, and meteorologists. But in 1958, it was decided that America's first astronaut class would be chosen from the ranks of military test pilots. This decision barred women from applying to be astronauts because they could not enter the military. NASA turned to Dr. William Randolph Lovelace, an aerospace physician, to develop the physical and mental tests that the astronaut applicants would go through to ensure that they could handle all of the unknown challenges space travel held. 
Lovelace accepted the position and began testing to find the best men for the job. But at the same time, he found private funding to do the same tests on female candidates who met the same qualifications. At the time, these women were known as the First Lady Astronaut Trainees, or FLATS. The term Mercury 13 wasn't used to describe this group of women until the 1990s. Testing astronauts isn't cheap, so where did Dr. Lovelace get the funding to put these women through training? The answer is Jacqueline Cochran, who was the head of the Women Air Force Service Pilots, or as they're more commonly referred to, the WASPs. She was also the wife of Floyd Odlum, one of the richest men in America at the time. Jackie Cochran was a pioneer in women's aviation and a prominent racing pilot. In her time as a pilot, she set many records, which include being the first woman to break the sound barrier on May 18, 1953, just six years after it was initially broken by Chuck Yeager. The first lady astronaut trainees were handpicked by Lovelace. They were not tested as a group. Rather, they came to the Lovelace facility individually or in pairs. The first woman to go through testing was Geraldine Jerry Cobb. After Cobb's success, Lovelace expanded the program to include 25 women, 13 of which made the final cut and got to move on to training. There were three phases to training. The first phase included physical tests and exams. The second was psychological screenings and neurological exams, and the third was a series of simulations. All 13 women completed the first phase, three women completed the second, and Jerry Cobb was the only woman to go through all three phases. She scored in the top 2% of all astronaut candidates, even outperforming some of the Mercury 7. The program was sadly canceled in 1962, not because of funding, but because of Lovelace's ability to test women on the simulations. In order to do the space simulations needed for the rest of the women to complete Phase 3, Lovelace needed access to military facilities and equipment that were now being used to train the Mercury 7 in the hopes of making it to the moon before the Soviet Union. There just wasn't time to test these women for a private program when NASA had no intention of ever sending any of these women to space. Even though none of these women have flown in space yet, they were pioneers for all women in aviation and space exploration, and I'm going to highlight their accomplishments outside of the FLATS program. To begin with, Jerry Cobb gained her pilot's license at 17 years old and her commercial pilot's license on her 18th birthday. Cobb set world records in speed, distance, and altitude flown during her 20s and was the first woman to fly in the Paris Air Show, the world's largest air exposition. In 1962, Cobb testified before the Congressional Special Subcommittee of the Selection of Astronauts, where she lobbied for women to become astronauts. After Cobb was denied an exception to become an astronaut, she began doing missionary work, where she transported supplies to indigenous tribes. During this time, she also surveyed for new flying routes over remote areas like the Andes Mountains and Amazon Rainforest. In 1999, the National Organization for Women ran a campaign to send Cobb to space alongside John Glenn when NASA was doing tests to see the effects of microgravity on aged bodies. The campaign was unsuccessful, and Jerry Cobb passed away in 19 2019, never getting to live her dream of going to space. Myrtle Cagle began flying at a young age and earned her wings at age 14. She joined her school's aeronautics class, and when her teacher was drafted to serve in World War II, she finished out the year as the instructor. Cagle joined the Civil Air Patrol and had dreams of becoming a WASP. She was a certified flight instructor, flight, instru flight instrument instructor, and ground instructor. In 1988, Cagle began, became the first woman to graduate from Georgia Technical Institute with a rating in airframe and power plant mechanics. In 2003, she was inducted into the Georgia Aviation Hall of Fame. Marion and Jane Dietrich were identical twin sisters who were the only girls in their high school's aviation class. They both got their student pilot license at age 16. The Flying Twins placed second in the 1951 all-women's transcontinental air race known as the Powder Puff Derby. Janet went on to become the first woman to earn an airline transport pilot's license, the highest FAA license. Janet had a successful career until her twin's death in 1974. Mary Wallace Wally Funk was the first female air safety investigator for the National Transport Safety Board, the first female civilian flight instructor on a military base at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and the first female Federal Aviation Agency inspector. 
Funk dropped out of high school at age 16 because her high school would not permit her to take classes like mechanical drawing and auto mechanics. She went on to attend Stevens College in Missouri where she graduated with a pilot's license and an associate's of the arts. She was the youngest of the Mercury 13 at 21 years old. She applied to be an astronaut three times and was denied all three times because she did not have a background in engineering. Despite having tested better than John Glenn in almost all of the astronaut candidate tests. In 2012, she paid to become one of the first people to fly in space with Virgin Galactic. She currently lives in Texas and flies every Saturday as an instructor. Sarah Gorlick, a Kansas native, raced in the Powder Puff Derby. She graduated from the University of Denver with a bachelor's in mathematics with minors in physics, chemistry, and aeronautics. After participating in the FLATS program, she became an accountant at the IRS. Jane Janie Briggs Hart was a founding member of the National Organization for Women. She earned her first pilot's license during World War II and was, a, was the first female helicopter pilot in Michigan. Jean Hickson served as a WASP during World War II and was the second woman to break the sound barrier. After the flats program ended, she went to work at the Flight Simulator Techniques Branch of the U.S. Air Force Reserve in Dayton, Ohio. Rhea Waltman had her private pilot and commercial pilot license, as well as a rating as a glider pilot. After the FLATS program, she went on to do glider training for the Air Force in Colorado Springs. She retired her pilot's license in 2014. Jean Nora Stumbaugh began flying her junior year of high school. She joined the Civil Air Patrol. She was the first female flight instructor at Oklahoma University. After the FLATS program, she moved to Wichita, Kansas, where she began work as a pilot for Beechcraft. She was rated to fly all their aircraft. In 2017, she was forced to stop flying due to G degeneration in her left eye. There isn't much information about Irene Leverington's life outside of that she started her own business called Aviation Research Man Management in 1985. Jerry Sloan flew North American B-52s under Texas Instruments with her husband, Joe Truehill. Though, through this, she developed terrain-following radar and smart bombs. Sloan was good friends with Jerry Cobb, who got her involved with the Mercury 13. Bernie Stedman received a pilot's license before she got her driver's license. She, began, she became a charter pilot and even operated her own flight school. Stedman was one of the first women in America to get her airline transport rating, the highest rating a pilot can receive. It is so important to share the stories of women in STEAM who have paved the way for those of us who are now a part of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. I truly believe the Sally Ride quote I read at the beginning of this presentation, because seeing women in aerospace engineering and related spaces has kept me going as a college student. Just imagine what it can do for little girls everywhere. So I encourage you to go out and share the stories of the Mercury 13. Thank you for watching this episode of the Virtual Women in Steam Week Gala. Be sure to watch the other episodes in the playlist to view the full show. To learn how you can get involved with Steam education and engagement efforts to empower the next generation of innovators, visit our website, letsgofullsteamahead.com.